Good evening. And mm -hmm. first, I'd like to thank Ariane Hartzogundi for handling the meeting logistics. She always does a great job for us. Second, please mute yourself, unless, um, except if you have a speaking role at some point, and uh, silence any devices. And please place your questions or comments in the chat. That will help Sally Stubbs, who's going to be managing our question and answer at the end, okay? Today's topic is very hot since the General Assembly overrode the governor's veto of two bills yesterday that will impact how elections are administered in North Carolina, both at the state and county levels. Our speaker is Representative Marsha Moray, who I've known for decades who represents State House District 30 in Durham and serves as a minority whip in the House. Prior to running for the legislature, Marsha served many years as a judge in Durham, including being the chief district court judge for a number of years. Her personal claim to fame is that she was a champion breaststroker who competed for the United States in Montreal at the Summer Olympics in 1976. Marsha, we're gonna turn uh, the hot topic session over to you and we look forward to your briefing. Thank you. Thank, th thank you so much, Ellen. <laughs> My claim to fame is I, I also got eaten alive by the East Germans at the Olympics, so I came home to get in uh, <laughs> to politics. But it, it's great to be with you all. I feel very intimidated, especially with Jennifer here. Uh, she has been in the gallery watching over all the proceedings and she is the expert uh, with all election matters. And so I hope she will kind of grade my paper and add to and uh, be a part of this. I'm trying to get back to our gallery view because I don't want to look at myself. Uh, much better. Okay. Anyway, Jennifer, really appreciate your being here and being up there. She was there all day yesterday. Um, so yesterday we had five votes and they were all veto votes. And uh, two of them, as Ellen said, uh, involved the election laws and the administration of the Board of Elections. I'll go through just kind of the highlights because they do get very complicated. They do get very much down in the weeds. This um, is not all inclusive because when we passed the budget uh, last month, there were many provisions about elections. Uh, North Carolina would no longer be a participant in the ERIC or the national verification of voting and registration and um, ballot verification, which is too bad because I think it was nonpartisan, a really great way for states to identify uh, voters and maintain excellent voting records. So no longer will North Carolina be a part of ERIC. The budget did not adequately fund our Board of Elections with all the changes that have come in for implementing uh, voter ID for these new changes that we're gonna hear about tonight. So I'm really worried that we've put a lot more administrative responsibilities and regulations in without funding uh, what our Board of Elections uh, justly deserves. So there are two bills, basically, I'll, I'll talk about uh, a little bit. The first one, it's easy to remember, it's just like the jumbo jet, 747. And they say 747, at least the Democrats said it was a monster voting bill. Um, and I know you all are nonpartisan, so take anything I say, uh, I am a Democrat coming from that perspective, but I will try and be as objective as I can while I bite my tongue. Um, if it slips, uh, you, you can call me out. No, it sure don't matter. Uh, both of these bills, uh, the governor has vetoed and uh, they overrode his veto. So they became law as of yesterday. Lawsuits have been filed with each of these bills. So we are going to see maybe federal lawsuits and maybe state lawsuits 
about some of these provisions. And we can talk about that when, when you'd like to. The, probably the biggest uh, change in 747 that most people have talked about, pretty much now when you file your ballot, if you've mailed in a ballot and it comes in the night after midnight on election day, it can still be counted. There's a three day grace period. The new law says no, no ballot received after election day is valid. They will not be counted. That would have changed several elections in the past. That would have changed, and it was brought up on the floor yesterday that uh, Chief Justice Newby would not have won the Chief Justice race because ballots that came in after election day that were counted put him over Sherry Beasley a few years ago. So, you know, we don't know why. We have many other states that they have this grace period. Many other Republican states have up to 10 days. Ohio has five days. Uh, why we're going to this drop deadline of election day, all mailed ballots must be received and counted. That will be our new law. That will probably be challenged in court. Uh, veterans overseas, and Jennifer, tell me if I'm wrong, their ballots can still come in and have a grace period. But civilians living here in North Carolina, sending in a mail-in, their ballot would be ineligible. Is that right, Jennifer, that the overseas for the veterans? I, I think that's right because they're they're under a different law that refers to the overseas voting that I think provides for that. Yeah. Because it's so so unreliable from overseas, of course. Well, it's unreliable from neighborhood to neighborhood, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. So the, the, the uh, education will be to all voters, if you're mailing in, get it mailed in more than a week before Election Day. Um, so that'll be a change. Um, it bans the use of private money for election administration. Um, we had in the last election, donations would come in for food, for election workers, for pens, for papers, things that you know a, a county may not be able to provide. And so private donations would help uh, get the local election boards up to speed, making sure everyone had like if there was water or what they needed. This bans the use of any private money for the election administration. Another big change is it empowers the poll observers, uh, give much broader powers. If you have observers from either party, what they can do, they are much more free to move about. They can talk to the election judges. They can photograph. They can uh, watch voters come in, come out. They can talk to the election judges. They can overhear conversations between a voter who's asking a question of an election judge. Uh, many of us had real concerns about that. Would that lead to voter intimidation? Uh, will, will it cause disruption? Will it slow down the process? We have real worries about the new expanded uh, permissibilities of the, the poll observers. Um, it does expand who can challenge uh, ballots. Currently, if you're a resident or in the precinct, you can challenge someone who is in that precinct uh, voting. Now it's like anyone in the county can challenge any other voter in the county for casting a ballot if they have reason. So it could open up a lot more challenges to uh, voters voting within a county. The other main part that I'll talk about um, is the same day registration that up until election day, you can register and cast a vote if you have proper documentation. And now you also have to have the photo ID, but it could it is now considered a retrievable ballot that the Board of Elections locally will send out a postcard and if it came back to the Board of Elections undeliverable, that vote would not be counted. Um, that is a major change to what we currently have. Voters may now have to take an extra step taking more documents into their Board of Elections to make sure they don't have a retrievable ballot or a provisional ballot that will be allowed. 
So that's just another step in the process. If you have a same day registration, if your address is changed, um, things you have to provide to the local board and verification with that postmark postcard that is mailed to you. And if it came back to the Board of Elections, the ballot would not be counted in the final certification unless it was cured. What Governor Cooper said when he vetoed this bill, he said, this bill has nothing to do with election security and everything to do with the Republicans keeping and gaining power. North Carolina has conducted fair and secure elections, but this bill will block voters and their ballots unnecessarily. That was the governor's reason for his veto. On the Republican side, the bill sponsor said he filed the bill, when North Carolina voters vote, democracy wins. That's why we are creating a secure election system that makes it easy to vote and protects election integrity. That was the other side of the coin. Even though there has been no evidence of any rampant or voter fraud other than a few minor instances in North Carolina. Um, we think it on our side thought it was unnecessary. It's burdensome. It's confusing. We're really worried about what happens when you go to the polls on election day and the confusion, especially with these poll observers, what that will entail. That's kind of the, the major points I have on 747. Jennifer, do you want to add anything that um, I missed on that? Um, no, I don't think so. I'm actually more concerned about seven, uh, 749. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there was, there is one other provision, and it's a pilot that the State Board of Elections will pick 10 counties for signature verification. So if you're doing a mail in ballot in one of these 10 counties, that they will decide which ones. It's a pilot right now, but your mail-in ballot, you have a witness to verify your signature, but also your own signature. And once that goes in, they will check and verify that the voter's signature matches their original voter card on file at the Board of Elections. Let me give you an example. My mother is 103. <laughs> She registered to vote in 1940. She is totally blind. She can't sign. She does an X. She would be discounted. It's a real problem. It is a pilot. It will not throw aside any ballots, but it may be the next step down the road that they want to have signature verification. There are a lot of problems with it. Many of us, I have no idea how I signed my voter registration card 30 some years ago. So that, that is a concern. That is something we'll be watching. Okay, before I put you to sleep, we'll move on to the, the other bill that uh, Ellen asked me to talk about. And this is Senate Bill 749. Um, this was called No Partisan Advantage in Elections. The better the bill sounds, the worse it is. So this uh, also uh, yesterday during the veto along party lines, no one diverged. All Democrats voted against, all Republicans voted for. The veto was overturned on party lines. This has a lot of changes to the administration of North Carolina's election laws. The, the most obvious one is we currently have odd numbers and the governor's party has the majority on the state board and local board of elections. And the governor picks on the state board three members from his own party and two members from the Republican party of names that they submit. So it's an odd number. Any vote that comes up, there will be a winner and there will be a loser. The same with local boards. Two are from the governor's party. One is from the, the other party. If next year, I know Jane Stein's on here, let's say in eight years, if there happens to be a Republican governor, then that Republican would have the majority of the board of elections at the state, three to two and local. So the proposal, what now became the law is, 
They're taking all the governor's appointments away. It's going to the legislature and it's even numbered. So there will be, we go from five state board of election to eight. There will be four Republicans chosen by Republican leadership and four Democrats chosen by the minority leadership. And they say this takes away partisan advantage. Well, what it does, it creates gridlock. They say it kind of mirrors the Federal Elections Committee. Well, they're totally gridlocked and it doesn't work. Um, I did an amendment along with uh, Pricey Harrison. Well, let's, okay, if you want to change and you really want more fairness, let's add an, an unaffiliated voter and keep an odd number, but let's select an unaffiliated they're almost the highest majority voting block in the state and they're totally un, un, unrepresented. Um, the amendments failed, but it was a way keep an odd number at an unaffiliated uh, that, that was rejected. But the biggest change is, you know, the Board of Elections is part of the administrative agency of the state. The governor is elected to have administrative authority over agencies. This is stripping that. This is stripping the checks and balances of what the executive has, what the legislative have, and what the judiciary has. This is giving total control of the Board of Elections to the legislature. The gridlock we're worried about, the Board of Elections selects the executive director, who now is Karen Brinson Bill. If this new group of eight Four Dems, four Republicans can't decide on a new executive director within 30 days. Guess who gets to choose? Phil Berger and Tim Moore. Legislative leaders will choose the new executive director. My guess is Karen Brinson Bell will no longer be our executive director of our board of elections, which is a shame. Personally, I think she has done a, a heroic job, very nonpartisan, very fair and impartial, but that's what we're looking at. We're looking at them having the ability to appoint the local board of elections for a hundred counties, um, which is kind of frightening. How can we begin to do, they do that many appointments? Um, I think we've created chaos. This will be challenged in court. Uh, we're worried about the gridlock, worried about the inability to get an executive director and once again, uh, you know, the governor said, this is nothing to do about partisan advantage. This is just power politics. I gave a floor speech yesterday on this. And I said, you know, we asked the voters in our constitutional amendments a few years ago, do you want this type of authority to go to the legislature, not the governor? 61% of all voters in North Carolina said no keep the Board of Elections and Ethics as it is. So we're flying in the face of what voters told us with the Constitutional Amendment. We're flying in the face of what our Supreme Court said would be unconstitutional, our prior Supreme Court, not our Supreme Court that came in in January of this year. Um, so they just ignored that, pushed it through, we're doing it anyway, and that is the bill that became law um, yesterday. Um, there is more to that bill and Jennifer, you'll be able to help me with it. Um, that, that is probably the biggest part that I'm worried about. Jennifer, you want to add in anything on 749? No, I agree to me. That's, that's the, that's, that is the worst part. I mean, you look at, like you say, at the FEC, which is I just uh, found some figures that 24% of the things they're asked to look at, they deadlock on. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, if, and the, the, the concern also the early voting that it defaults to potentially to one site. That's right. If, if the local can't agree on early voting sites, as Jennifer said, it defaults to one voting site. So can you imagine if you're in Charlotte or Raleigh or in a bigger county and you have gridlock, one early voting site for a half million people. Yep, you see, you see what can happen. There was another bill and it was removing governor appointment powers in Senate Bill 512. Once again, 
it totally stops the balance of powers. Um, we now have judges that are elected. The budget gave the legislature the power to appoint 10 new judges. Right now, the governor appoints judges where there are vacancies or new judges created. That's gone. It will now go to the General Assembly leaders of 10 new judges. I think that's a first step where they want to go to totally partisan appointment of judges on the judiciary, which is really scary to me because that does not make them an independent branch. It makes them beholden to the legislative branch. I will mention just briefly, and then I will stop um, redistricting. Uh, we had a special master draw congressional districts because they were declared unconstitutional by our state Supreme Court, that they were racially partisan gerrymandered. So the congressional maps and the Senate map were to be redrawn because a special master drew the districts and that could only be for one election cycle. And so now new maps have to be drawn. Our new Supreme Court said, new maps will be drawn for every, every race, legislative race, the House, the Senate, and Congress. So we have a redistricting committee in the House. We're getting ready to vote on these maps, not next week, but the week after. The redistricting committee has never met. They have never met this year. There have been three public forums in the state, in the East, in Raleigh, and in the West, that uh, Senator Heiss and Representative Destin Hall, the judiciary leaders, conducted. People came. I went to the one in Raleigh. There were 80 speakers for over almost three hours. And I think all but two said, this is not an open, transparent process. We want to see you draw the maps. We want to comment on the maps once you have drawn them. Do not just take them to a vote. Well, guess what? Those maps are already drawn. They're sitting in a desk drawer somewhere. The Republicans know what the boundaries will be. We have no idea. So we will go in, not next week, but the week after, they will put the maps on our desk and there will be an up or down vote. We have just drawn who we want as our constituents and the Democrats or the public has no say about it. And the redistricting committee has never met. They will meet probably one time to vote on the maps that are presented and they'll go immediately to the Senate and the House floor. Um, I introduced a Fair Maps Act this year along with Pricey Harrison and Robert Reeves and it's calling for an independent redistricting commission. We have to stop legislators from drawing their own districts. Um, there are going to be big changes. You have a supermajority that wants to be a super, super majority. Um, so we will see where that goes and there will be lawsuits about it. I think I have talked way too much. I hope it was somewhat helpful and Ellen, I'll throw it back to you, or if you have any questions, happy to try to answer it, or Doc can give it to Jennifer. Well, um, I put a couple of my questions in the chat already, but maybe I can just ask one of them real fast as a follow up on what you said on 749. You, you outlined the appointments for the State Board of Elections. Uh, where the General Assembly just is the decider. Isn't that also the case for the 100 counties where the county boards of elections are also, the appointment will be made by right. the General Assembly? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to counties. highlight that. I mean, that's really kind of amazing to have them overseeing um, yeah. all those boards. And then if they get in a stalemate and can't make a decision, does I, I can't remember because I, I skimmed that bill a while ago. Do you know 
um, if there is an impasse, because we'll have four members, and if they have a 2 2 tie, would their um, stalemate be bumped up to the General Assembly for them to help be the deciders or not? I think that's right. If there's a stalemate, just like early voting sites, there will either be a default like to the original one voting site or they will make the decision and send it back to the county. Is that right, Jennifer? I don't want to give you any misleading information. I'm not 100% positive, but I think in the case of a stalemate, legislative leaders will make the decision. I think that's right. I'm not sure it's really even spelled out what happens entirely. Or there's just no action. You know, there's gridlock. But, you know, I mean, uh, votes, the votes, I can't. They after they do the canvas, don't they have a vote to certify the election? We do. If 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 it was locked up two two, what happens to the election? Right. And there's there were some points raised. What if the counties refuse to certify? They just say we don't like yeah. the results. We're not going to certify, and then it goes to the general assembly. What if the general assembly says we don't like the votes count the tallies? We're not certifying. Um, so there, there are real concerns there. And it does, the administrative part goes to the Secretary of State's office. And Elaine Marshall was very upset about that. She said, you know, the Secretary of State has so much work to do and they're getting no money for it. And they don't want it housed at the Secretary of State's office for administrative purposes. But that was also a part of the bill. Helen? Okay, so um, Sally, uh, do we have- I, I took myself off the chat. Very boldly. Okay. Um, I, I do wanna say that I had a question originally from uh, Patty Reeser, I hope I'm saying that right, that seems to have disappeared from the chat. So um, if Patty is still on and wants I to am. ask her question. <laughs> I am, and I realized that, that I, I was, uh, my, my question was about signature verification. And, and I realized that in the context of a pilot project where I understood you to say, none of those votes would actually be discarded. Right. That my question was jumping ahead to when it's not a pilot project, which is just the, I'm a retired nurse practitioner, huge number of people who have, are diagnosed with conditions that affect their signatures over the decades. And I know that signature verification is already required in some states. And I just wonder how that aligns with the ADA. I mean, there's, or if there is a, if those voters, voters are verified and would be able, would have an opportunity to cure their ballot if their signature was dismissed. I mean, it's just a mess. I hope we don't get to that, Patty, but I'm sure they will have to be ADA compliant, but they'll have to go through the hoops and the steps to get there, you know? We had in our last election, non-presidential, we had a 51% turnout of voters. Don't you think we should be doing more to get more voters on a non-presidential election up to 80%? We're gonna see voting drop. You know, already people are scared about voter ID. They don't want to go and be embarrassed and be turned away. Um, and with these new provisions, um, we'll see what happens. All right, I have a question here from Paulette Tepes Chasson. Do you think the 14th Congressional District will be gone along with Representative Jeff Jackson due to the new maps? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Wiley Nickel and Jeff Jackson and Kathy Manning are the most at risk. Um, I mean, that's just, you know, that's just politics. We're just looking at that. And uh, so that that's what the word is and we'll, we'll see what happens, but we won't have a seven, seven equal split on our congressional delegation anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you know at this point, Marsha, when you might see the maps? or you know, first set? Ellen, they said uh, we will vote on them a week from Tuesday, which is what, the 24th? Be, we're told to be back 
um, yeah, the 24th, 25th, and 26th. Okay, I have another question from Debbie Bishop. Why did they withdraw from the multi-state voter verification program to be sure only registered in one state? That's a good question. I don't know. I think it was foolish and uh, irresponsible. But I think Cleta Mitchell, who worked for Trump, uh, that was one of her recommendations. Mm -hmm. You know, the more confusion we can sow, let's do it. Let's not like have Marcia's computers. And, uh, let's get rid of Eric. Mm -hmm. All right. Mary Monroe Kolek asks, what is anticipated in terms of lawsuits, pathways, timing? To my knowledge, three lawsuits have already been filed. They were filed by the state Democratic Party. They were filed by the National Democratic Party. And there was one filed by voters, I think, in Cabarrus County. I'm not sure. So those are filed, and they will be going after many of the issues we've just talked about. I haven't read them, so I'm not up to uh, snuff about them. I think some of them, our only hope is if they go to federal uh, federal voting rights violations, because we know what our North Carolina Supreme Court would do. When you have a father-son team from the leadership in the Senate to the justice on the Supreme Court, um, kind of the writing's on the wall. Helen Maxwell, I think you were trying to ask a question. Yes, Helen Maxwell asked, what can the public do at this point? Well, I think it's just like what I do. The more you educate people about what's happening, uh, how it affects their lives, what's important to them, and if they can't express that through a fair right to vote, I hope that will get people uh, up in arms and out to vote uh, regardless of party. I mean, if we have 31% who are not identified with either party, if we get them educated about this, um, it is our democracy, uh, you know, and a lot of people don't understand, well, you know, democracy, but uh, we are losing and suppressing uh, and manipulating votes. Uh, mm -hmm. Simple as that. Well, Patty, Patty has come back again. Yay. I read today on threads that uh, Mark Elias is also filing suit on something in North Carolina. Yeah, he posted that directly from his democracy docket thread. It's just a post. I don't know that he didn't have details. Yeah. I'm not sure wh which issues he's going after, but bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> and I just saw tomorrow Mark Robinson's holding a press conference about being um, the uh, interim governor while Governor Cooper's going to Japan. So we may have a new interim governor for a few days. Oh, and Jennifer Rubin has posted, yes, they did file. I'll try to send you the link. And that's the chat so far. Uh, Jennifer, you got a question, comment? Yeah, this is just, I guess it's sort of a comment that um, it came out in the Rules Committee hearing in the House that normally, or I should say heretofore, what has happened um, is that uh, to name the county boards, the parties nominate people, uh, and then the, the previously the governor selected. Um, but what came out is that they the they the answer to the a question from Reeves was that they do not have to select from among the nominees put forward by the party, and then they can the person has to be the matching party, so that has to be a Democrat. But of course, as we know, a Republican could change his registration or her registration to Republican. I mean, it takes a couple of minutes to change your party of registration, and there's no so that in effect. The, they would not be bound to have even numbers of party members on the boards of election, which is not a good thing. <laughs> no. Well, and we're worried about that with people who are uh, thinking about filing to run, that there will be plants, that there will be Republicans change their registration, file to vote as a Democrat, get elected and do what Trisha Cotham did 
and change back to their original party affiliation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that it, it, dirty tricks are are coming in and starting, and and we are concerned about that. Mm -hmm. You could end up with, with boards in that are all Republicans, in effect. The one thing I didn't mention, we're upset that this redistricting is so late in the year. We've known this since January. And you, people said, why, why have you all waited so long? You did nothing in July and August, which is totally true. But keep in mind, these maps will probably pass uh, the first by the 1st of November, the end of October. We file on December 1st for our seat. And there's a one year residency requirement to file as a legislator oh. or Senate and you have to live in your district for a year. That gives about seven days for someone to move. If they don't know the districts, it changes and they wanna run. They got seven days to find a new place to live. But the Republicans on the other hand, who know these maps, who have seen where it's gonna be, they're going to be moved in, polishing the silver and cleaning the windows because, you know, they're all set. Mm. Okay, I'm getting snarky and, and uh, party. <laughs> Take me back. Let's see. Do we have any? Oh, we have some new things. Um, let's see. Oh, Helen Maxwell says thank you. Uh, Vicki Shea, this seems like electoral gluttony. Have they overreached? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just dumbfounded. I mean, yeah. they're super majority. They have what they want. And now to keep manipulating and tightening these rules and power, um, it's it's just confounding. To say that we have to change, no, you know, partisan elections, integrity in voting, we have integrity in voting. I mean, I have a picture of the Speaker of the House with a sign, stop the steal, you know, protesting, you know, <laughs> stop the steal. <laughs> Trump was elected. Um, and now they're they're turning it around and, and putting the fear in people that don't trust our electoral system which has been fine and operating. And uh, I, I would say one of the best in the country under Karen Brinson Bell's leadership and the state board. Mary Monroe Kolek says, this is not suppression, it's subversion. And Jennifer did send uh, the link to what she had been talking about earlier. So I invite you all to the chat to to copy the link. Well, I am afraid we are losing our democracy. It's becoming authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, it's not only these boards. I mean, there was a, a bill, <laughs> the legislature now wants to take over the High School Athletic Association <laughs> because <laughs> members, their athletes were declared ineligible and they were so upset they want to kick out uh, Q Tucker, who's been there for 30 years, the UNC system, the High School Athletic Association, they want the records of nonprofits that don't even receive state money, but are operating in the state with disability rights. You know, they, they've just said public records, legislatures, you don't have to have any public records if you don't want to. Well, we've had a request, I'm re turning all mine over. I'm a public servant. My records have always been public records. They should remain that. But in the budget, they took that away. Um, the governor, gover, government ops can now go in and investigate any state agency or any agency receiving state money. Um, and it has to stay confidential. I mean, th this new power is just unimaginable on mm -hmm. Okay, you may have any jokes. I have, <laughs> I have, I have a, a, a comment on the, also Go on ahead, that. Jennifer. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, I have a comment on the question of judicial election uh, because, as you as you know, of course, in the budget they added these ten special superior court judges who could be added to things, but. Um, the, the league in South Carolina uh, did a study of what happens when the legislature elects judges. They have one of the few states 
log logically enough, uh, where the legislature elects the judges. Um, and um, they found that the people who were most likely to become judges, uh, whether that was, uh, you know, superior district court type judges or um, on their court of appeals or whatever, were, this will come as no surprise, former legislators. Mm -hmm. And in fact, more than half of their court of appeals was made up of former legislators. And this is a really, um, you know, dangerous sort of slope that we could be on if they do try to elect, sift to a, a judicial, to election of judges by the legislature. Um, and one of the problems was that in order to campaign, people had, the judges had to campaign as judges, as you know very well, judges have to campaign. But since they were the people who were the electorate were the, the legislature, they had to campaign at the legislature. And that gave people who were former legislators a real advantage because they have floor privileges. They can march in and go in and talk to the other members, you know, the, the, their former colleagues anytime they want. Whereas judges or people who wanted to be judges who were not former members actually had to try to catch legislators in the parking garage, um, like members of a different profession. And, um, you know, I mean, that's it's just horrible to think that we might be evolving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Well, and steps are being taken that way. When, uh, in the budget, uh, we have what we call judicial standards. And judicial standards is the overseer of ethics for all judges, from a district court judge to the justices. And in the budget, uh, they removed all the lawyers from judicial standards that were appointed by the bar. They took four lawyers off and gave the appointments to speaker and the Senate pro tem leader. We no longer have state bar lawyers who know more about ethics and expectations of judges. They're gone. And it's all targeted, as many people have said, and it's been written to get rid of Justice Earls, to get her off by judicial standards because she has spoken out about the administration of justice, which she's very entitled to do that. Hmm. But they don't like it. And so... I mean, it's, there's our balance of democracy. I have another question, uh, again from Mary Kolick. Is there any evidence the business community have appetite for helping stem the tide of what seems to be a loss of democracy in North Carolina? I don't know. I would hope everyone is concerned and everyone... Mm -hmm wants to keep our balance uh, and our every vote counts, you know, I, I think it's in everyone's best interest. I have not heard of any group of businesses that have been a big lead on it. I know groups of businesses have about our public schools. Uh, they want good education, good worker pipeline, uh, but I don't know about um, this particular issue. Okay, and Emily Keel asks, will there be any Republicans who see these vast changes as unfair and speak out? Is there anything being done to foster that, I wonder? If you look at the votes that are taken, the votes have stayed pretty much uh, lockstep party line. If there is any deviation to any of these vetoes, it has been a few Democrats going and voting uh, with the Republicans on, on some of the, the bills. The election bills, there was no deviation. Uh, but for the Republicans to break rank and come, that has not happened. Um, I, you know, common sense, I've had many conversations with Republicans after a vote and said, you know, that really makes a lot of sense. I believe what you say, but I just couldn't vote that way. And that but um, they have very tightly controlled caucus. Yeah. And Jennifer Bremer asks, what, if anything, can we do to fight back against the possible removal of Justice Earls, who, of course, is also an expert on voting rights and redistricting? Well, I think the, the awareness, because much of it is done, judicial standards is done uh, confidentially. She has filed a lawsuit in federal court uh, to stop uh, this investigation of her uh, based on her right to free speech to talk about the administration of justice. We'll see where that goes, if there will be an injunction issued or not. That will be very telling. But, uh, you know, so much is just public education. Um, and once again, I, I will say 
you were hearing it from my side, it would be nice if we'd have someone, you know, on the other side to, to have a healthy dialogue or, or conversation about it. So uh, keep, keep that in mind. I'm very aware that, you know, I'm giving you my perspective of it. That might be another hot topic. <laughs> um, Vicki Shea asks, are there any changes in the partisan dynamics anticipated after Speaker Moore is no longer in office? It'll be interesting. Uh, there are two that are vying for the speakership right now, uh, just like in Washington, I guess, Steve Scalise. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the preferred one over Jordan today. But uh, John Bell is the majority leader and Destin Hall is the rules chair. And it sounds like the two of them are going to kind of buy for it. I don't think you'll ever know what you get until they take the podium. Um, and then we will find out. Um, so we we all are hoping for more openness, more communication, more transparency, that we if we go in a committee, you don't have floaters come in and alter the vote from the members of the committee, which we have now, which means I'm on Judiciary Committee. And if the members there are four Democrats and five Republicans and two Republicans don't show and we call for a vote, the chairman of the committee will say, let's wait. And then four Republicans not on the committee come in the room, sit down and vote with the Republicans. They win every time. And that that's in the rules. They have floaters. Democrats have no floaters, but Republicans have floaters. They can go in any committee at any time and determine the vote. I hope things like that change. You know, I, I hope we get a little more fairness and, and transparency back. Hmm. Sally, well, uh, uh, Jennifer Bremer has her hand up again. No? Okay. Maybe not. Okay. All right. Uh, I I just want to ask one thing, Marsha. You piqued my interest. You, you, did you say that you have sponsored a bill with another House member uh, to have an independent redistricting commission. I assume it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> right. We, we've, I've introduced it the six years ago when I got there with Pricey Harrison, and we did it this year uh, called the Fair Maps Act. And it is calling for a constitutional amendment asking for an independent citizen redistricting committee uh, that would come in 2030. Um, give it some time, get out the kinks. We met with the California Citizen Independent Redistricting mm -hmm. Committee. They've been going for 15 years now and they got the kinks out and I, I think they're doing a great job. They they were very informative. Uh, you know, there are always problems with everything, but the worst solution we have right now is for us to sit down and draw our own districts. That has got to stop. Right. And, you know, th this league and I think, uh, leagues around the state are very interested in seeing an independent redistricting commission. In fact, uh, this league, uh, Jennifer Bremer actually took the lead on it, uh, but Jennifer Rubin and, and I were also engaged. We worked with Sanford uh, public policy students last year. They did a study for us, an independent study looking at the lay of the land nationally for redistricting. And a lot of the independent redistricting commissions have come about via citizen initiatives. But of course, citizen initiatives aren't allowed in North Carolina. So we don't even have that escape valve of here we are as frustrated citizens and we don't have a route to take to get you know enough signatures to get it on the ballot and see what our citizens have to say about it because i would imagine given this turmoil in particular right now there would be a lot of interest possibly in an independent commission actually you know when the democrats are in the Majority, the Republicans introduced bills for an independent citizen. <laughs> That's great. Um, here we are with the, the flip of the coin. 
And yeah, lot- un- unfortunately, the Democrats blew it. I, I guess they thought they were always going to be in power. But, you know, in, in the end, I think no matter which party's in power, the better part of valor is to have an independent commission. I totally agree. Hmm. Well, I just got one more from Mary Kolick. Uh, Given an alert I just got about Robinson's plan for special event, governor may want to stay home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe we want him to stay home. <laughs> <laughs> And we're getting a number of uh, comments. Uh, kudos to you. you. Lots of kudos, Marcia, <laughs> for your great comments. Well, I yes. I appreciate it. Thank you all for your, your, the League of Women Voters is so important. And I really appreciate it. And anytime we can answer anything or do anything, uh, I'm always here. So thank you very much for yeah. having me. Well, again, on behalf of our league, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to speak with us, answer uh, our questions candidly. Very much appreciate it. Ellen, thank you. And thank you for putting up with me for all these years in Durham. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen's a role model. She was on the county commissioners when I was an assistant DA and, and showed me the way. So I really appreciate it. Thank and I you. have to say one thing about Marsha, because we haven't her, I mean, this isn't even her real, ex- her expertise is juvenile justice. And when she was our chief district court judge, we did some, we had, we were leaders in the state and you of course led the charge to raise the age for adult jurisdiction uh, in the state. We, want, we were just about the last state in the country to do that. Um, and so, Marsha was an amazing person to work with in terms of Mm. some of the legislative proposals that we in Durham put forward and ended up getting passed uh, in the General Assembly. So thank you for your tremendous work. Thank thank you, Helen. Appreciate it. Okay, I'll sign off and- Okay. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, you bet, thanks. All right. Okay, bye.